Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tony Bergantino. I'm the director of the Wyoming State Climate Office and the Water Resources Data System. And we're glad to have you with us for this Conditions and Outlook webinar today. The webinar is put on by my office, along with Natural Resources Conservation Service, U.S. Geological Survey, the State Engineer's Office, uh, the Bureau of Land Management, the National Weather Service, uh, the USDA Northern Plains Climate Hub and University of Wyoming Extension, and the Bureau of Reclamation. On behalf of those mentioned, I'd like to thank you for joining us today as we take a look at current drought and climate conditions, uh, snowpack, uh, surface water status, water administration, uh, weather forecasts and outlooks, including fire potential. And then at the end, we'll have a little bit on how you can help uh, report what you're experiencing. So let's start it off with current conditions. And we have the just released drought monitor map. And before we get too far into what we're seeing here, I want to spend a little time on what the categories on the map are showing here and how they're arrived at. And who better to hear that from than the National Drought Mitigation Center itself. Uh, this video is about three minutes long and uh, explains the categories and what they mean. Uh, the center is in Lincoln, Nebraska, so you'll just have to imagine that the map of Nebraska is actually Wyoming. <laughs> Each category on the U.S. Drought Monitor has a percentile range associated with it. For example, D4 is in the first to second percentile range. Percentiles help to place the drought into a historical context. Let's look at this another way using 100 years of precipitation data from a station in Nebraska. Percentiles are determined by ranking the data from largest to smallest. In this example, 2007 had the highest precipitation with just over 39 inches of rainfall, and 2012 had the least with about 11 and a half inches. Additional years falling in the top five wettest and driest are indicated by raindrops. Let's rank the precipitation amounts in order from the year with the most precipitation to the year with the least precipitation. The average or mean precipitation for this location is 24.21. This exact amount only occurred in two years out of 100, 1962 and 1995. Now let's apply the percentile categories for the U.S. Drought Monitor. Exceptional drought, D4, corresponds to the lowest two precipitation values. This is the most severe drought with the worst conditions on record. It would only be expected to occur once or twice within 100 year period. Extreme drought, D3, occupies position three through five. These conditions are still among the worst on record and would be expected to occur once every 20 to 50 years. Severe drought, D2, occupies positions 6 through 10. This type of drought would be expected to occur once every 10 to 20 years. Moderate drought, D1, occupies positions 11 through 20. This type of drought would be expected to occur about once every 5 to 10 years. Abnormally dry conditions, D0, occupy positions 21 through 30. We would expect these types of conditions once every three to five years. Rainfall that falls within the top 70 positions do not get a designation on the U.S. Drought Monitor and show up as white areas on the map. As you can see, drought is truly a rare event and extreme and exceptional droughts are even rarer. All right, so a good analogy to how the drought monitor is formed is say a person going into the, into the doctor's office and describing some symptoms. And when people send in reports of ponds drying up, the pastures producing less, uh, these are similar to symptoms being reported and cause us in the drought monitor author to, 
to run tests or look at the data to see what the situation is. And data, data are what drive the drought monitor, but we, we need to know what you're experiencing to take a closer look at a specific area. And sometimes those symptoms reported cause us to look at things differently, such as, oh, considering longer time periods or whether a particular index needs to carry some more weight in, a, in an area or time frame. Uh, there's a national author who creates the map each week. It's released on Thursdays and valid through the previous Tuesday. Uh, so this one was just released this morning and was of last Tuesday. And while the states provide input, the final map is a product authored by the National Drought Mitigation Center, uh, NOAA, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Well, we've had some improvements in the last month. Uh, a lot of these uh, are from the result of the, the recent snows that we've seen, and they're uh, highlighted here in green. Uh, unfortunately, there are also some areas outlined in red, and those are areas that have gone down a category or more in the last month. And many of these are attributed to you know, long-term dryness persisting or some areas that have missed out on the, on the recent precipitation. This is the 14-day precipitation as a percentile. This is the total precipitation that's fallen over the last two weeks. And you can see quite a bit of green and blues and purples on the map, which is good. Uh, a lot of Wyoming is, is covered with that. The gray areas are right at the median. Uh, so the green, blue, purple are, are uh, higher than uh, median precipitation. There are some pockets here that are in the yellows and oranges, uh, which has received less than uh, median over the last two weeks. And then especially down here in the Southeast, we have uh, especially uh, Laramie County, which is uh, down in the fifth to 10th percentile or less in, in some parts. Looking at that same type of map over the last uh, uh, three months, 90 days, you can see a lot more red on the map, but some of the same areas are showing up here in the greens and blues. Uh, Carbon County, a little bit up here in the top, uh, Sweetwater, Fremont, Natrona, and then up here into the Bighorns in the Northeast. But then we do have these areas of concern over here in the, in the west and the higher elevation, the wind, the uh, Tetons, and coming down here into, into Lincoln County, as well as the Sierra Madres and Medicine Bow. And again, uh, uh, Laramie County is, is in the red as well. And looking at uh, just the last 30 days, this is the, the precipitation departure from average. This is where you take uh, how much uh, precip normally falls within the 30 days and then compare it to what has fallen. And you can see again, these, these areas here in green having uh, uh, departures that are positive or receive more precipitation than, than average, uh, especially up here in the Northeast and then coming down here into, into Lincoln County. And then some of the same culprits in the Tetons and winds and then down here in the, in the Southeast where we were, um, uh, the departure is below uh, or less than average. Now, this is the standardized precipitation evapotranspiration index, or as, as we call it, SPI, since that's a little long. The SPI is built upon another index called the standardized precipitation index, or SPI. And they both use raw precipitation totals over different time intervals going back several months and years. And those values are then fit to a, to a statistical distribution from which can be calculated the the chances or the probability of an observed amount of precipitation happening at a given time scale. And that probability allows us to compare precipitation across different areas that have different climates. And you know, receiving you know, 41 hundredths of an inch in Manderson sure isn't gonna be the same as that same 41 hundredths in uh, say Bondurant. And also because the drought monitor is based upon the probability of various conditions occurring, the SPI and the SPEI are very useful for classifying drought levels. The index value ends up being the number of standard deviations that an observed value is away from the mean or average. So the scale on these maps is not inches of precipitation or any amount of precipitation, but is rather a number ranging from uh, less than negative two on the low side to up over positive two on the, on the high side. And if the value is negative, it's dry. If it's positive, it's on the, on the wet side. And from that, then we come to the SPEI, which is shown here which goes one step further and includes evapotranspiration into the mix. And that adds a measure of what the water demand might be. So uh, how thirsty the atmosphere is. So with these maps, you get a sense of not only the water coming into the system via precipitation, but then you also have the potential loss of water to the atmosphere through evapotranspiration. And you can see on these maps that the, 
the recent precip has kind of dominated here, especially up in the, the Bighorn and Northeast where we're seeing these bluer colors over here in Lincoln County again. Uh, we do have some emerging uh, dryness here in the last 30 days in, uh, in Laramie County that kind of missed out on some of this recent precipitation. And you see some of the similar things over here on the 60 day in the upper right. Coming down here to the lower right, this is the this time frame is one year, and you can see that at the longer time frames, the dryness dominates. And you can see, especially up here in Park County and the Bighorn Basin uh, Northeast, and then, uh, still showing up here down in the, in the Southeast, these stronger areas of, of dryness and concern. Switching over to temperature, uh, again, looking at a two week period like we did with the first precipitation map. This on the upper right here is showing absolute uh, minimum temperatures over the last uh, two weeks, uh, the average. And then down here on the, uh, the lower left, we're looking at the 14 day departure from the average. And down here on the departure side, you can see that uh, most of the state is uh, below normal. You got a few little pockets here that are degree or so above normal, but uh, by and large, as you go to the Northeast, your uh, departure from uh, normal on the negative side is greater. And looking over here at the absolute uh, temperatures, uh, lows are still mostly below freezing across the entire state. Uh, warmest areas up in the Big Warm Basin, uh, over here in the powder, and then uh, east central and the, the southern part where we're seeing um, lows only, you know, high 20s as we're, we're getting down to at night. During the day for the maximum temperatures, we're looking at the same, uh, same type of setup here, two week uh, average uh, departure on the lower uh, left here and absolute on the upper right here. Um, the higher elevations up here on the, on the right and the absolute value, we're looking almost up to freezing for most of the area. There's a few areas where our nighttime lows are still getting down uh, below zero, but they're, they're very high up. Uh, and then mid fifties uh, on the plains and higher here in the Southeast. And then some areas here in the, in the Southwest where we're also seeing that, but by and large forties uh, and higher for a lot of the state. Looking at that as the departure from normal uh, below average, everywhere except uh, Laramie County. And coincidentally, it looks like the city of Laramie here where we're just a, a degree or so above, above average. And then uh, similar to with the minimums, as you go north and east, uh, the departures are a little bit greater on the negative side. And now we'll look at the 30 day average temperature. This is uh, 30 days of the last month or so as a departure from average. Uh, no areas in the state in the last month were above average. Uh, and it looks like uh, about the southern, not quite half or so, was about zero to three degrees below average, with the northern a little bit more than half, uh, three to six, and in some places up to nine degrees uh, below average over the last month. Switching over to soil moisture here, uh, this shows that recent storms have really improved things. Uh, soil moisture has really improved in the last, uh, uh, from two weeks ago. Uh, in fact, we've got two areas here, one in, in the far northeast and then in Fremont County where uh, soil moisture is right about the median in terms of percentile, whereas uh, two weeks ago we had a lot of, a lot more red on the map uh, and quite a few areas were actually down in that uh, second or less percentile. And now uh, the only ones that we're seeing there in that, that low range is a little bit here in uh, central Johnson County. And just looking at two places, uh, two points on the map for how soil moisture is doing. We have, first of all, our station at Sheridan, about uh, seven miles east southeast of Sheridan, where you can see uh, the weekend storms and the snow that was dumped there has started to react in the, in the soil column here. Um, the gray here at about two inches, blue at four inches, uh, the red here at eight inches, and then the green here at 20 inches. A uh, little bit of a delay, obviously, in the, uh, the deeper here at 20. Uh, unfortunately, nothing, no response really, except a little bit of a bump up here, barely perceptible on the, at the one meter or 40 inch depth. And then one other location, uh, this is station in the Thunder Basin grasslands over here on the uh, uh, Converse Campbell border thereabouts. You can see the 
uh, cold in the early part of uh, March really reduced the soil moisture with you know, the, uh, the moisture in the soil freezing up even more. And then you got the storms here from the weekend pushing that soil moisture up a little bit. Uh, already at that shallow depth, we're starting to see a decline. Uh, we're still going up here at the uh, 30, 40 centimeter range. And then a little bit closer to the surface of 20 centimeters, we've kind of leveled off. And we are still seeing a little bit of a rise down there at uh, the half meter, 20 inch uh, area. Let's jump over to some uh, drought lines to take a look at how things have been in the past here. This shows the percentage of Wyoming in each category of drought from uh, 2000 to present. As you can see, the current drought here, statewide at least, uh, is most significant since 2012-13 uh, in terms of the area affected. Uh, and in terms of duration, it has in some sense exceeded that, although the D4 that was pre uh, prevalent here in the 2012 into 2013 is just a little bit of a blip right there. So uh, not quite as intense on, on that end. Uh, at present, we have had one area of the state or another in this D3 or extreme drought now for the past 93 weeks. And that exceeds everything going back into the early 2000s when we had a 206 week period starting in July and going into uh, July of uh, 2001, going into uh, June of 2005 right here. And the area of the state in that D1 to D4 actually decreased by about 3% in the last month, thanks largely to these recent snows. And here uh, is a zoom in on that previous timeline showing conditions from the start of 2020 up to present. And Wyoming obviously covers a, a lot of ground. So conditions in one county are gonna be quite a bit different or can be quite a bit different than in another. Uh, so I do also have timelines for each of the individual counties. Uh, but owing to the time here, I won't go into them. They are available if you go to the link here at the bottom of the slide and go into the counties though, if you wanna take a look at your particular area. And this is showing here up at the top that we've had uh, uh, 33 weeks now where the entire state has been in one of these D categories, not necessarily drought, but we, because we do have a little bit of this D zero here, which is that abnormally dry, but a category nonetheless. Now, Jim Fahey with the Natural Resources Conservation Service is gonna talk a lot more about snowpack in just a moment, but I wanted to give you a quick summary here as to where we are with the basins around the state uh, regarding peak snow water equivalent. And the table here shows each of the ma major basins around the state. Uh, the last two columns here are the medium, median uh, peak snow water equivalent in inches, and then the median date on which that occurs. And the first several columns here are stats for this year. We aren't finished yet, so many of these dates, or some of these dates at least, may change here depending on what happens up here in the next week. But these columns show the date of this year's peak so far. Uh, this shows what that peak was so far in terms of snow water equivalent in inches. Uh, this one here shows the, the number of days either above, uh, past or in, uh, earlier than the, the median peak. And then the, this just shows the, the differences in inches from that peak. And the final one here shows the, uh, that uh, peak snow water equivalent as just a percent of the median. Uh, dates in red were uh, earlier than the median and ones in blue later. And values in red were less than the median while those in blue were greater than the median. So as of now, I think nine of the basins have their peak uh, snow water equivalent later than the median, but unfortunately, uh, you don't see any snow water equivalent peaks here in the, in the blue. So all the basins did peak uh, as of this date below the median. Uh, we'll see in a bit, there's a, a chance we could see a little bit more of an increase in those, but uh, time will tell. So with that, I will turn it over to Jim Fahey, who, as I said, was with the, the Natural Resources Conservation Service to continue talking about snowpack. Good afternoon. Thanks, Tony. Thanks for having me, as always. Uh, Jim Fahey, working at NCS in Casper. This will be, I think, my 19th or 20th spring runoff in Wyoming. And uh, here we go again with the chaos known as spring in Wyoming. Um, just looking at the current conditions uh, a couple of days ago, 
uh, on the left there. Statewide average is up to 99%, and that's uh, about 1% greater than uh, last year at this time. And as you can see uh, by the, the more greens in the uh, uh, 2000 or the current year uh, versus what we had uh, last year. So we did have some improvements uh, in slight improvements from last year on, on quite a few basins. Again, uh, like Tony said, the late, the mid to late April uh, sn uh, snow and precipitation we've been experiencing have helped a lot. Okay. Next one. And then just looking at it, just a couple of three basins looking at the uh, the traces. Uh, again, the green line is the is the median, and then a little tiny, if you can see it, what Tony was talking about, the uh, the median peak. Um, and then just looking at the three basins of snake, currently 90% of median. Uh, the black line is the current trace. The blue line, if you can see, it is the last year's trace. As you can see, it all started to melt out pretty early. Last year, they didn't really have any uh, significant precipitation in April. And then this, uh, the, the red line is just the 30-year uh, me median low uh, snow water equivalent line. Again, Tongue did quite well as well for the, um, the late season snow. Uh, we're up to about 112% of median. And that's still lower than last year, but again, uh, way above the, the lowest, lowest percentile as we were, we were getting close to that um, in uh, late March. And the last one to look at is the Upper North Platte, 94% uh, median. And that really hasn't changed much right, uh, throughout the last couple of months. So like a little bit of an increase, but they weren't, they didn't get as much precipitation out of this last system as Tony noted. Um, and again, just below the median and right on uh, just a little bit above what we had last year at this time. Okay, next slide. And basin precipitation, this is up to March, uh, the March uh, precipitation we had. Again, that was a dry month, as you'd see in the reds on the northwest and the west part of the state, as well as the northeast part of the state. And of course, that uh, April is going to be much better, much better and much darker blues and purples probably on the colors because of the high amount of precipitation we had this month. As far as the water, water year precipitation through uh, March of this year, uh, pretty much uh, a lot of areas near median, uh, near more normal average, and a few areas again in the northwest and west and northeast are uh, below median for water year precipitation. Next slide. Again, USB Bureau Reclamation is also on this call. Or they may be talking more about the uh, uh, the Great Plains basins uh, area, you know, east of the Continental Divide. But just a note. Uh, uh, looking at these, uh, the blue lines here are the, are the current capacity, and look at the snake has stayed at uh, about 21 to 22 percent of, of capacity since uh, last uh, fall. Um, there is talk uh, that maybe with a little bit this extra precip it might help, but there was talk that they, they may not fill that reservoir this year, and that that would be unprecedented. For all the 20 years I've been here, I've never seen that before. And again, the Bureau of Mesa is going to talk more about their reservoirs, but the other one to note is the, uh, the Upper North Platte Basin uh, is current capacity is about, is below 50%. And the other, as you can see, the other colors are, are last year's capacity, current percent of median is the lighter orange, I guess you'd call it. And then the left, the fourth bar over is last year's median. Again, percent of median is, is what the reservoir storage is uh, right now or, or this time of year for the time of year. Um, so again, as a, as a whole, the state is still below median for uh, reservoir storage. Next slide. This is a kind of something I worked on last year a little bit, uh, looking at um, kind of a busy looking graph here. On the left is the median, median and averages, uh, blue, the snow water equivalent of precipitation. And then the, the the line graph with the triangles, that's the actual, that's the flow that we experienced uh, April through uh, July on that, this particular uh, point, the poison inflow. And of course the 2022 is the forecast that we put, uh, had for the April through July. And this is all 50% exceedance values. So you write down, you know, those are usually what we go with, with the forecast. Um, 
And as you can see, I kind of highlighted uh, what Tony was talking about. The last major drought was 2012 and 13. Kind of how we've, we're, we've done 2000 to 2001. We kind of kind of came into the drought. We, we did have better flows than we did in 2012 and 13. And then we are predicting uh, with better conditions, a little bit higher flow. But again, and then this yellow line, just add to the clutter, is the, uh, the 30-year median for the uh, uh, Flow of, of right, the flows from this particular point. So now we'll go to the next next slide. And now that I've explained all the colors, hopefully we can, we can pick it up a little bit here. This is another the Powder River uh, when it comes into uh, Montana. Uh, same scheme here. But as you can see, this is the powder and the tongue are highly dependent on uh, April and May precipitation. That's why you're seeing these these spikes up here in like. 2017 and 2019. And again, here's our current drought. Um, I've been pretty quick, pretty close to what we've seen in 2012 and 2013 as well as, as far as the April through July flows. Again, we're a little optimistic. Uh, hopefully with that the last precipitation, this again was the April 1 forecast. So we'll have another forecast next week for the May 1st. And hopefully this number will increase or, or uh, as well. And next slide. Again, Tongue River reservoir inflows, same scheme on the uh, looking at 2012. We're about the same as in 2021 as the flows we saw in the, that drought, those two, two drought years. And again, our forecast is a little bit better than uh, what we had the last couple of years. Next slide. And one last one is the uh, Upper North Platte, the Seminole reservoir inflow. Um, and as you can see, we Kind of bottomed out in 2021 on the flows, kind of comparable to 2012 and 13. Again, uh, with better antecedent conditions, we're thinking maybe a little bit better flow, but still below the 30-year uh, median of our 660,000 acre feet. Next slide. And just the highlights: um, snowpack and snow water equivalents. Again, by this is late March, we're below median. Precipitations across Wyoming from March are also below median. It's a continuing theme. <laughs> Precipitation uh, water year totals are slightly below median. That's not so bad. Overall reservoir storage, just kind of mentioned that late March and the Bureau of Reclamation will probably talk more about that, are below median for the whole state. And our stream below, uh, volume forecasts, April through July across Wyoming are generally statewide below median. And then the last slide, I'll just highlight the uh, the whole state. And here we are, and color coded by uh, percent of median. As you can see, we, bear, we have only a couple places that are near median um, the Great Bull River and the Bighorn Basin. And then the, the Laramie watershed coming in past Laramie is also looking, and the Prell Creek uh, near Casper Douglas is also. But, but over, uh, overall, uh, below median, I can see highlighted the Northeast. And the southwest are the, the lowest in the state for uh, forecasted uh, water flow April through July. Again, the numbers in red here are the 50% exceeding values from the forecast. And uh, that's about all I had. Um, I guess I'll just look for questions at the end then. Appreciate you having me uh, talk and uh, have a good afternoon. Thanks, Jim. Next up is Aaron Piacetti with the U.S. Geological Survey. He's going to talk to us about surface water. Thanks, Tony. Um, well, I'll just start right in here. Um, this first hydrograph I have is a, it's an area-based um, runoff duration, a seven-day average runoff. Um, so on the y-axis, that's runoff in millimeters. So that's an area-based calculation. And, and the point of this graph here is what I wanted to show you is kind of where we are on the on the hydrograph and we're starting to come out of base flows, winter base flows in Wyoming, starting to see a little bit of water moving into the system here now that we're almost in May 1st, which is kind of unbelievable. But um, so here, you know, the, the point here being is that we're approaching runoff. It's kind of started to begin depending on where you are if you get your water from the mountains it's starting to begin if you get your water from the prairie there's a chance that that water is already kind of moved through the system and you're waiting on 
uh, sporadic precipitation that hopefully will come and continue to come. So, um, so yeah, we'll be moving on here to higher run higher flow conditions as snowmelt begins. Uh, next slide, please, Tony. So here's a look at the current uh, real-time stream flow conditions throughout the state. It's kind of a hodgepodge of um, the green, which is normal, and that's a range from your 25th to 50th percentile. So it's normal to have low flows and it's normal to have high flows um, within those kind of two, two quartiles. But in general, it seems like in the west, eastern two-thirds of the state, we have pretty normal conditions for the stations that are uh, reporting. And then in the western third, we have this below normal, this 10 to 24th percentile in a fair amount of stations reporting. And then there's some uh, much below normals and some, and some really low values over uh, on the snake and up into the, uh, into the park. So it's kind of a mixed bag right now. Uh, next slide, please. So here's kind of the, the daily stream flow trends for the last 45 days. This is 50 sites reporting. So it's approximately a third of the sites that we have in Wyoming. Um, and you see that, you know, we have about starting off at the um, beginning of or middle of March, we have, you know, about half of the sites reporting normal values. As we come into the latter part of the state, we see some precipitation that fell throughout the state or some runoff that started to occur. You see some blues and light blues in there. That means uh, above normal or much above normal conditions that kind of quickly dissipated and we're back to probably around 40% of the sites or a little bit less reporting normal conditions and an increase in uh, below normal to much below normal. Um, so, you know, things are just kind of bouncing around a little bit as we get precip and things melt off or a little bit of runoff starts. Um, so the next slide, please. So I'll just kind of bounce around the state to look at a few uh, select gauges. Um, here's the North Fork Shoshone near Wapiti. You start to see that uh, where you've had a little bump in flow here towards the latter part of March that kind of raised things up and it quickly dipped back down into the middle part of April to get into that below normal. And then we're kind of just hanging at that uh, 24th, 25th percentile right now um, as we're kind of waiting for runoff to come out of the come out of the park in the mountains up there. Moving over to the Bighorn at Kane, uh, a, a regulated river here. Um, flows have been pretty steady since the end of January, kind of in that normal range. Of, you know, the flows appear to be below the median right now as flows have kind of decreased over April, um, but things are kind of hanging and steady there as um, depending on how the, the rivers manage there for moving water down into the Bighorn Reservoir. But in general, things are pretty steady. I haven't really seen much of a change from runoff in the Bighorn in that location. Moving to the east on the powder, um, we're kind of seeing that we had pretty you know, higher flows um, kind of coming out of January and February, um, closer to that above normal. And then things have kind of dropped off into March and April. Um, so things, things are starting to get a little bit lower there, but there has been a little bit of a recent bump increase in flows to get it up to that, just barely up to that. 25th percentile range, but things are kind of uh, a, a little bit drier there right now. So moving to the southeast at the North Platte at the state line, um, you know, since January, things have been pretty low, hanging in that below normal range. And then here kind of coming into the later part of April into May, things have gone down pretty low. Um, kind of looking at that 
uh, duration hydrograph, you can see that um, that much below normal, that dark brown kind of dips dips really low there um, in this time of year. So that's that's a, not an unprecedented thing to have for flows to dip quite a bit at this time of year there, but a, a, a highly regulated system and uh, just that's the flows that are occurring according to management and water supply there. Moving on to the to the west here, the Green River below Fontenelle, that, that one's been uh, real steady here for the last a uh, few months here that um, just been water has been moving out of Fontenelle Reservoir and, and downstream in the Green River. Um, things have just been held steady. We haven't seen any change in flow there in quite some time, um, but expect here in the next month as there's water to move through the system from runoff, it'll start to increase. The next slide, Tony. So just to cover briefly, I know um, kind of in between folks presenting on reservoir contents, but in general throughout the state from this teacup diagram that the uh, university produces, not much has changed in storage throughout the state in the last month. And that's kind of largely due to what I've been talking about is we still don't have a lot of water moving through the system. There's not a lot of water to store right now, and uh, that'll likely change here uh, in the next month as we start to have some more water supply in the system. So that's all I have, Tony. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Aaron. And next up, we have Nicole Nielsen with the Bureau of Reclamation, who's going to talk about reservoir operations. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about our current reservoir conditions uh, within the Bighorn Basin and the North Pot Basin um, coming off a dry year and these drought like conditions this year. Um, they are also affecting how we are storing and delivering our water. Uh, the Bighorn system is shown on the map here in the uh, blue overlay and it does end up sending water to irrigate approximately 200,000 acres of farmland. So we try to be very mindful of our water conditions and operations for our irrigation district partners. So far this water year, the inflows um, into the reservoir have been below average. Uh, this graph to the right is just showing uh, the runoff for the Buffalo Bill Reservoir for the past 30 years. And as you can see, most of the annual water supply um, comes from runoff during the April through July timeframe. Um, and in fact, at Buffalo Bill, it's almost 80% of our annual supply. This uh, time period accounts for 75% of the runoff at Seminole and 60% uh, at Boyson. And these are all of the upper system reservoirs. So while we uh, continuously monitor the water supply conditions, uh, Reclamation makes an official forecast at the beginning of each month. Our last uh, forecast based on the April 1st conditions um, has not taken into account the April pre precipitation that we have received um, in the last month or so. So the uh, Buffalo Bill expected forecast for April through July was 500 uh, kilo acre feet, which was about 68% of average. And the Boyson forecast was 450 kilo acre feet, which was 75% of average. The Bighorn Reservoirs are at 71% full. Bull Lake and Boysen contents are above average for this time of year. Both reservoirs are expected to fill under our uh, expected forecast. Buffalo Bill is only 59% full. And as of our current forecast, we do not expect it to fill. So while the percent of average numbers are looking good, the below normal uh, snowpack we are seeing has our forecasted numbers looking below average. We do expect to have adequate supply for our irrigation water um, and our irrigation district partners. Next slide. The other system that the Wyoming Area Office maintains is the North Platte system. Uh, the North Platte system is shown in the, the peach color there. Yep, and it supplies water to 400,000 acres of farmland. Uh, last year, the North Platte system went into an allocation in June and ended uh, the water year 21 with a below average storage. 
There is still a little bit of snow melt expected in the, the very upper system, but most of the snow that we have received has melted in um, all of our lower elevations. As of yesterday, the North Platte system is at 57% uh, full, which is about 89% of average. And while this may not seem too bad, uh, we haven't started any irrigation deliveries and um, typically we would have started that by now in, in a normal year. So the North Platte uh, forecast numbers are quite a bit below average and we are currently anticipating an allocation to begin with the first delivery of storage water. Um, for each of these reservoirs, we do update the operation plans based on the new month's forecast, um, forecasted runoff numbers. On the left, you can see our operations for our Seminole Reservoir, and that's our uppermost reservoir in the North Platte system. So the red line is the reservoir elevation based upon our expected runoff numbers, and then the green and blue are based on our minimum and maximum numbers. And uh, then the graph below that is the anticipated releases. So, and then the, the light blue line on the top is the full conservation of the reservoir. So as you can see, Seminole isn't gonna get close to filling under any of our uh, plans. Um, but again, these are gonna be updated at the beginning of next week. Uh, these operating plans uh, can also be seen on our reclamation website um, under our reservation uh, reservoir operations tab. So. Uh, the last slide is just showing the current operations for our North Platte system and our Big Horn Basin. Um, our current releases from Buffalo Bill and Boyson are uh, 1,050 and 1,000 CFS respectively. Um, releases are currently being determined based on the irrigation demands there. On the North Platte, up until last week, we were at minimum releases out of Seminole and Cordis trying to save our water in our upper system, you know, as long as possible. But last week we did bump it up to 1500 CFS to start filling Pathfinder in um, preparation for our irrigation demands. And then the Gray Reef uh, is currently releasing 500 CFS and uh, 25 CFS out of Glendo just to fill up Guernsey. Generally around this time of the year, we start transferring waters to our inland lakes over in Nebraska, but we've been asked to hold off for a few weeks um, since our irrigation district partners are waiting on our May forecast numbers to determine how much water they're gonna have for this year. And they're um, trying to hold out as long as possible before they start taking their water. So. Overall this year, our operations are gonna be controlled releases with little to no bypass, which is um, to be expected for our below average water years. That's all. Thank you, Nicole. And now we'll have uh, Jeff Cowley, who's with the state engineer's office and he'll discuss water rights administration. Thank you, Tony. Um, glad to be here and we'll get started as quick as we can here. This, the map shown here, is the divisions and district maps for the state of Wyoming. Uh, give or take, the southeast corner of Wyoming is division one, northeast corner is division two, that middle north, the blue color is division three, and the reddish color there in the west is division four. So it, as you take note here, um, later on in the season, as we get more calls and, and we present those, Tony will start to highlight some of those districts the smaller pieces of the divisions, and, and you'll be able to see what are, what are calls and what are not right now. So uh, keep in mind or pay attention here before we go to the next map, that north-south line between divisions two and three, that, that uh, line, if you go a little bit, there you go, Tony, that line right there in the middle um, is gonna be a division line I'll, I'll bring up here on the next map. So if you could go to the next slide, Tony. You'll notice right there, this is a map of all of our compacts and court decrees that, that Wyoming is a part of. As Wyoming is a headwater state, there's lots of folks downstream of us that like to keep track of the water. So that same north-south line there in between the Wind River Bighorn Basin and the Powder River Basin shows that, that some of these decrees are a bit more complicated as they cross division and district lines. So um, it, it's one of the things that we're, we're ha we have to coordinate quite a bit on um, between our our different entities in the state of Wyoming. Um, the one to, to pay attention to here, which I'll get to in a couple slides, is that Tongue River Basin in the up along the state line right there, and then the North Platte River Basin, as those are our two biggest calls 
uh, slash allocations that we're in right now. So if you could go to the next slide, Tony. So right now, um, for the month of April, we have a, a call uh, that's on right now. Um, the Bureau puts out their forecast, as Nicole just mentioned, they put out their forecast in February, March, April, and May um, to, to measure their um, what's in storage and what is sitting on the mountain, the projected inflow. So if that number that they project each year doesn't meet the 1.1 million acre feet, uh, depending on what uh, reservoir or account we would be trying to fill, that would then place a call. So to be specific to this year, um, on April 5th, the Bureau uh, provided those numbers and, and placed a call or, or informed us that an allocation was, was eminent to fill those Inland Lakes account that Nicole was just talking about. Um, we did some homework on it, double checked. Um, on April 7th, the state engineer validated that call. And as of April 8th, we got letters out to everyone in the, in the North Platte Basin and, and started that call on a priority date of December 6, 1904. Um, that is the priority date for Inland Lakes. We, we have municipalities and industries are recording their pumpage for each day or, or this month um, from April 8th through the 30th. That, that's the time frame for this call. Those entities are looking to either a temporary water use agreement, which is what a TWUA is, or they look to Pathfinder mod. Um, back not that long ago, we, we added some, some uh, height to the top of Pathfinder Dam to get storage back from, from what was lost to sedimentation in the bottom of that reservoir. In doing that, we, we created a, an account of 20,000 acre feet that can be used for municipalities in times of shortage. So this is the exact, uh, need for that that account and some of those um, industries and municipal well, municipalities are, are able to buy some of that water from the bureau to make up for their um, uses during that uh, April 8th to 30th time frame and the irrigators in the basin are also regulated to that 1904 priority date and uh, Michelle Jess is on here she's our North Platte coordinator and she um, is step number four here she is <laughs> nearly in constant contact with industries and municipalities as they're trying to figure this out and and make sure that they're they're toeing the line and, and doing their part. So um, if we could go to the next slide, Tony. In Division Two, um, we have the Yellowstone River Compact, and more specifically in Wyoming, the Colling Basin right now is the Tongue River Basin, and that is um, a call that that we got on April first of uh, this year. Montana did their homework and, and came up with a number and placed a call to fill Tongue, Reser Tongue River Reservoir, I'm sorry. Uh, that takes into account in Wyoming, a January 1st of 1950 is the priority date um, that, that we look at. We, we would turn off any junior diversions for irrigation. We would turn off any reservoirs that are storing. All, there, there's a little bit of a, a caveat to that, which I won't go into right this minute, but it also um, cuts back our domestic use, which in Wyoming is domestic use up to one acre. In the Yellowstone River Compact, that cuts Wyoming back to half an acre. Um, this is the month of April, so there isn't a whole lot going on as far as irrigation and domestic uses right now, so there wasn't a whole lot of people to turn off, but um, right at this very minute, um, Brandon and um, our, some of our Wyoming staff is on a call with Montana and some of their staff. As, as Jim showed a little bit ago, that Tongue River Basin is up to 112% on the SWE. So maybe that'll have an effect on their projections and, and maybe they'll be able to lift that call. Um, but they are speaking right at this moment. If you could go to the next slide, Tony. Uh, Division three, we have a call on Owl Creek to an 1888 priority date, which is a territorial right. Uh, there's a call on Dewsbury Creek to 1906, and in Division Four at this moment, knock on wood, there is not a call for allocation. But uh, to temper some of your your jumping for joy on that, as folks mentioned, uh, Jackson Lake at this point is 23% of full, which is a bit scary for that corner of the state. That's usually the, the water-rich corner of the state, and this year it's going to be a struggle. Like I mentioned, we probably won't fill that reservoir and. And, uh, and they have some issues trying to keep the fish flows downstream of that reservoir. Uh, last slide here, Tony. 
And just here's some contact information for those of you who don't know, we do have a new superintendent in Division One, Corey Reinhardt, and a new superintendent in Division Three, Josh Fredrickson. There's uh, their phone numbers. If you have any further questions as to what's going on in your basin, that's uh, the best way to get a hold of those guys. So um, appreciate the time, and we'll, we'll I'll monitor the questions if we have any. Thanks for that, Jeff. Now we'll uh, shift gears a little bit and look at forecasts and outlooks. And starting us off will be Lance Vanden Bogart with the National Weather Service in Riverton. And we'll talk about that. Great, thanks, Tony. So what you're seeing here is the seven day total precipitation forecast uh, across Wyoming. Uh, put some black label, black and white labels there just to kind of get a, a better view in case you can't view the, uh, the key there. But uh, overall, it looks like the areas that have been, uh, you know, fairly wet and uh, cooler than average, based on what Tony had shared, they're going to continue getting uh, more precipitation over the next week. There are uh, three weather sy systems coming through this week, which is uh, quite a bit, actually. And uh, those will drop down quite a bit of precipitation and uh, snow water equivalent as well for the mountains there. You can see the, the southwest and south central portion of the state are the areas that are likely going to be the missed, missed the most with, with these upcoming systems. Um, but pretty good news for the rest of the state. So we can go ahead and uh, jump forward here and look at the six to 10 day outlook. So looking a little bit further into the future, um, these graphics kind of show uh, the, the lean as far as, is it going to be a near normal? Is climatology the best forecast or is above average or below average the best forecast? And you can see for temperatures, there's not really a big signal as far as uh, whether it's going to be above or below normal for temperatures. So near climatology is your best bet there. Uh, as far as precipitation goes, a little bit better. There's a, a lean to above normal precipitation. So with the wet wet pattern we're in, that's going to continue into that you know two weeks out time frame uh, most likely, and go ahead and step forward here and look a little bit further in the future. This is the 8 to 14 day. You can see that by that time we get a little bit more ridging in the pattern, which often translates as warmer warmer temperatures. So leaning above normal uh, warmth for that time frame. And for precip precipitation, um, the pattern kind of, uh, there, there's not a lot to, to gather from that. So near climatology is going to be the best bet for most people. Maybe the northwest half of the state is above normal. Uh, but not a lot of signal there really to go off of. So climatology is probably going to be the best bet. If we look even further and kind of look at more of a seasonal outlook time frame, so this is the three-month outlook from May through July. You can see that there's a uh, likely above uh, normal warmth, so likely warmer than normal for especially the southern uh, southern half of the state, the southwest corner there. Um, this is May, June, July again, and um, even, but even the northern portions of the state do have a lean to above normal temperatures. And then precipitation, despite the near term looking uh, fairly wet, the, the overall seasonal outlook is still to have below normal precipitation over that three month period. And uh, that, that is only a lean, it's not an extremely confident, um, confident call for less than normal precip, but it is, it is currently looking like drier than normal. So that would not help with the longer term drought areas. And then I think there's one more graphic here. Um, this is just looking at the Wyoming flood potential. So this is not my particular area of expertise as a meteorologist, but we do deal with uh, river forecast centers and um, they're the experts in that area. And it's, it's still not looking like a, um, as we just saw in that three month outlook with the drier than normal lean, um, it's not looking like there's a lot of potential for widespread river flooding. You can see, in fact, in this graphic that everything remains green, which is, uh, it, it means that there's, an un, it's very unlikely, or we'll just say unlikely that we're going to even reach minor flood stage at all these different river forecast points. So you have to, you have to look uh, quite a bit into the tails of the distribution before you see any chance of even minor flooding. Um, note that river ice action is not accounted for. Uh, we're still in spring in Wyoming and we can get cold, but uh, as far as the actual snowpack and all the things that are modeled, it's not looking like there's going to be any sort of uh, widespread river flooding at this time. 
So with that, I'll go ahead and pass it off to the next presenter. Thanks, Lance. And that next presenter is Casey Chidra with the Bureau of Land Management uh, to discuss fuel status and wildland fire outlook. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this first slide just has a couple definitions and descriptions wanted to go over with folks of, of kind of what I'll be referring to on the next slides, but did want to kind of preface everything, uh, you know, mid-April, late April, I guess, as somebody mentioned, almost uh, May here, but it's a little bit early to be talking wildfires statewide in Wyoming, but I think it's a good time to, to start the conversation anyway, and then when we, when we get together next month, um, you know, probably probably have a lot clearer picture of where we're headed as far as fire season goes. But uh, one of the, the terms I'll use is ERC or energy release component. Um, really to kind of simplify that, basically just the available energy or the BTUs per square foot within a flaming front at the head of a fire. And that's derived as kind of a composition of these other fuel moistures that you might hear me refer to uh, this summer, but the 1,000 hour fuel moistures, those are our heavier fuels, our, our down logs, uh, dead trees, things like that. These are all dead fuel moistures. So those are anything in that three to eight inch diameter. Um, our 100 hour fuels, as we refer to them, one inch to three inches. So bigger limbs, branches, things like that, that might be especially in the, the timber fuel models. And then as we get into 10 hour, um, those are the quarter inch to one inch fuels. So small twigs, smaller branches, and then our one hour fuel moistures being the, basically the grass, right, our, our dead fine fuels. And so that would be either dead grass or dormant grass as we get into the later parts of the summer when things come out of green up. And then, um, and then live fuel moisture. So everything I just talked about would be dead fuels. And then uh, you'll hear me refer to the, the live fuel moisture as well, especially this time of year where we're moving from dormancy into green up. And then as we go through the summer, obviously we'll kind of go the other direction. And, and uh, go more into dormancy and then those live fuels uh, will become more important. Uh, next slide, Tony. So just looking at that energy release component as we talked about, uh, just the, the key over here, the, the percentile breakdowns of what each color means as far as where we're at uh, for this date, uh, for the last 15 years basically. So it's just a percentile uh, value of where we're at. And so if you look statewide, it's, it's always fun to go at the end because it really jives with what what everybody else has talked to as far as drought conditions, uh, precipitation, all that stuff. I, you know, the red ones obviously always stand out up here in the bighorns. And I think what's going on there um, is, is in our weather stations, we still have to manually go on and say when the fuels are, are under snow or, or basically turn a snow flag on as we call it in our remote weather stations. And so I think that Potentially what's happened there is that maybe those snow flags hadn't been turned on and we're not representing the snow cover up in the big horns, but it does indicate the a little warmer and drier winter that we've had and some of those heavier fuels. So, uh, but if you look in northeastern Wyoming over towards the Black Hills and up in the, the Thunder Basin, those areas, uh, as, as folks showed with the ongoing drought in those areas, we're still seeing that uh, fairly elevated conditions. And then you kind of catch a sneak peek over into South Dakota as well there. So kind of the same thing going on there. Of course, they, they did get this more recent precipitation, so hopefully improving there as well. Um, yeah, this map, you know, this this early kind of limited value, but it'll definitely this is something we really start to key in, in on uh, mid-May going forward through the summer and uh, we'll probably probably continue to use this graphic and one that we look at daily to make, make some of our fire uh, staffing decisions and things like that. Okay, next slide, Tony. So it's just a couple examples of, of the graphs that go into that map that was just up there uh, with the ERCs. And so uh, the blue line is currently uh, as far as in 2022 where we've been, the red line is maximums. And so uh, this is the big horns, obviously, but it does show um, obviously setting new maximums. And I think that's where that snow flag comes into account. So again, it, it does represent the the warmer, drier winter we've had, but I think they're missing probably the fact that those fuels do have a little bit of snow cover, although not as much as we would like, that, uh, that uh, probably a little bit off in that. But then you've got the gray line down here for the average that kind of shows the, the normal trajectory that we would see uh, through April going into the fire season. Uh, the, the heavy gray lines, the straight lines up there, that's the 90th and 97th percentiles. Those are, are pretty critical thresholds for us when we're making like I said, fire staffing decisions or, or whether to go into fire restrictions and things like that. So we'll, we'll be using that throughout the summer as well to, 
to broadcast some of this information. Uh, next slide, Tony. So this one, uh, same graph, just in that Devil's Tower area. I would say this is pretty accurate for what we're seeing up in that northeastern part of Wyoming, as we talked about. Um, ongoing drought up there and then really missing a lot of the moisture throughout the winter until here recently. And so it'll take a while for those fuels to direct some of that moisture, but you do see the big drop here um, when that storm came in, coming down, but already climbing back up just in the last couple of days. So um, well above average and, and kind of around those maximum values right now. We can go to that next slide. And then just wanted to go down to another part of the state, down in the, the Medicine Bows, the Snowy Range, and Sierra Madres, and take a look there. You know, they had that little better moisture early, and now we're starting to see kind of a lack of that moisture lately where the values are starting to climb back up there. And so moisture moving in from the north lately, we're, we're seeing the, the values uh, climb down in the southern part of the state. So as we go into May, it'll be something to really keep an eye on. And if we do the next one, Tony. So. Drew, uh, this is uh, from the Rocky Mountain Area Coordination Center, the Predictive Services, and so it's it's got a lot of Colorado and the rest of uh, the Rocky Mountain area, in Nebraska, and up into South Dakota. I just use that blue rectangle to kind of approximate Wyoming on that map so that folks can kind of see um, where we're at. I know it's not exact on there, so I apologize for that, but um, so this came out early April and what they're saying and what they're seeing for significant fire potential, taking a look at, at a lot of what everybody else has already talked about. Uh, so coming out of April, this is pretty in line with what we saw. You know, we saw significant fires out in eastern Colorado, over in Nebraska, and we had that potential definitely in southeastern Wyoming. But as we move into green up and especially with some of the recent moisture, although the southern part of the state got missed by a lot of that, kind of seeing maybe a break in May from the wildfire potential that's pretty normal as things green up and the higher elevations are still uh, under snow. So a little, uh, little quiet time here in May, but then as we move into June, we'll start to see the, uh, you know, see the effects of that snow come out of the mountains. We'll see those higher elevation fuels dry out. They're showing down in the Sierra Madre, snowy rain, some elevated potential going into June and then most of Northeastern Wyoming up in the, the uh, western part of the Black Hills and the Thunder Basin. And then going into July, showing uh, an increase in potential, just pretty much the northern part of the state. And kind of the last thing that, that I would close with is it's really um, the, the outlooks that we've been getting have been talking a lot about the, the likelihood of the monsoonal push, and, and they're expecting a, an above normal monsoonal flow, although Wyoming's always been an interesting spot on how we line up there, right? Because it's kind of on the northern end, or at least southern Wyoming's usually on kind of the northern end of some of that monsoonal flow. And I think that's why you're seeing there in July that potentially that southwestern Wyoming doesn't have that elevated potential that maybe some of that moisture is, is predicted to come up into southwestern Wyoming, but not go much further than that. Um, the problem with that is typically we get a fair bit of lightning with that as well. So the areas where we don't get the moisture, we do see more lightning. Uh, we'd see an increase in fire activity. But, uh, again, thanks for the time, and, and definitely the, the picture will be a lot clearer next time we, we meet, I think. So uh, thank you. Thanks, Casey. Very in informative. And now as to how to get involved, I'm going to skip the recap of the drought monitor in the interest of time. And I uh, just wanted to very briefly mention that you can uh, report conditions in your area through the Seymour system, which has the uh, URL up here. Uh, you can also submit uh, photographs through that. Uh, uh, photos from different vantage points really help out so we can get an idea of what conditions really are when they're normal and when they're uh, what you're reporting about. And the other system I wanted to talk to you about just very briefly is Coco Raz, which is a citizen science volunteer precipitation observation network. Um, observers uh, set up a four inch rain gauge that we can provide in your, your yard and you can uh, report each morning what precipitation you've gotten and that helps fill in some of the gaps such as the ones that you see on this map. This is just an example of some of the stations that went into creating uh, precipitation grids for a particular date. I chose uh, April 12th for this one. You can see a lot of stations on here from various networks, Weather Service, uh, NRCS, uh, Coco Raz, but you see a lot of gray spots. So 
we can always use volunteers in these gray spots to help refine what we're what we're putting into the into the drought monitor in terms of precipitation. And if you have any questions on those or you want any more information on those, the um, contact information is on here, as is the contact information for all the other presenters who's uh, uh, I really like to thank for, for joining us today and, and sharing the information that they have. And I will now turn it over to Wendy Kelly, who is with the USDA Northern Plains Climate Hub and also the University of Wyoming Extension. All right, great, thanks, Tony. And thank you to all the presenters and the attendees. I know that we are several minutes over the one hour time slot. Uh, that being said, we do wanna provide the opportunity for you to ask questions. If you have any, I did look at the Q&A button and I don't see any that have come in yet. Um, so I'll just monitor that for another minute. If you need to get going, I understand as well. So if you're looking for the Q&A button, it is toward the bottom of your screen and you'll see Q&A and you can just type a question in there. I'll give you a few minutes to uh, write a question. While I wait, I did uh, receive an email during the webinar asking about where the recording will be posted and available. So we do post this webinar recording on the University of Wyoming Extension's YouTube channel, so you can access it there. It's also linked on the Wyoming Drought Information and Resources website, which is in the bottom right corner of the current slide, which Tony is moving his cursor over right now. So the drought.wyo.gov. And if you go to webinars, we'll have the webinar posted on um, the website within about 24 hours it usually takes. So just looking for Q&A. I did see um, a couple of questions that were asked uh, when folks registered. And I think that most, if not all of those questions have been answered throughout the webinar. Uh, so thank you for providing those questions in advance. There was a few ag specific questions that were asked that we did not answer during today's webinar. So if you asked a um, ag specific question, feel free to reach out to me directly at W Kelly with the EY, the number one at uwyo.edu. And I'm happy to um, answer those questions with you and get you uh, resources as well as connect you with other individuals who might be uh, or are more likely knowledgeable than I am on your questions. Great, I still don't see any Q and A's that came in. So I think that uh, we were able to answer everybody's questions today. As always, feel free to reach out after the webinar to any one of the presenters and thank you all for your time.